I hope you like my earrings, I bought whistles, they're very cute. <laughs> Hello and welcome back to Lotus Literature. If you're new here, my name is Amy and I usually talk about books, university life, what it's like to study English and linguistics, everything related to that. And I'm way more active on my Instagram with the same name, you should go follow that. Um, if you want to head over there after the video, I'd be more than happy to follow you back, be friends with you, talk about books, that sort of thing. Today I wanted to talk about something that some readers love, some really appreciate, while others absolutely despise them, and that is classics, classic literature. If you've seen any of my other videos, you'll know that I'm someone who really likes some classics and absolutely hates others. And I'll be the first to say that Jane Austen, for example, her work was completely revolutionary, yet I'll also be the first person to say that I cannot stand. <laughs> Same goes for Virginia Woolf, a well-respected modernist writer, just not my cup of tea. On the other hand, I love all the great gothic classics. And these kinds of books were on my school syllabus, they're gonna be on my uni syllabus at some point, hopefully. So things like Dracula, Frankenstein, Wuthering Heights, I read over summer, Jane Eyre, I read over summer. Just a few there that I've named. Um, and I also love classic children's literature, which is why I chose to study it this year. Alice in Wonderland, Wind in the Willows, The Secret Garden, Tom's Midnight Garden, I've actually kind of got a bit more of an appreciation for that book now, never really liked it before but now that I've studied it and now I'm a bit older, it's actually not that bad. Today I will be staging a bit of a debate. Um, classics, are they relics or are they still really relevant? Um, I would love to know what you guys think of this so let me know in the comments below once the video is done or even now before I kind of pitch my ideas to you. That would be really appreciated, I'd love to talk to you a bit more about that too. Um, I'm also looking at a script, so if I keep looking down, I apologise, that's fine. My points will be alternating, so one for relic, one for relevance, kind of pro, against. Um, and I'll be focusing primarily on three main points, so the language and the changing vernacular style, so mother tongue, how it's changed, how we use language compared to like how they use language, some of the things they say that we don't really use as much anymore. Then I'll be talking about the changing portrayal of women compared to classics and contemporary works. And then I'll also be talking about generally history and society at the time. So I want to obviously begin with the first point I mentioned, which is the language used in the classics compared to our own vernacular language in a 21st century society. Um, I'm going to start with the relic side, so the kind of against classics where they're not relevant anymore. So language, think like Dickensian, think Jane Austen, um, even go back and think of Shakespeare and ask yourself what do these have in common? Language is what these all have in common for me because it can be a little bit difficult to wrap your head around what they're trying to say at first. Um, stylistically in particular. And when was the last time someone used the kind of like thou, the, hast thou, dost thou kind of language? Um, to you in person, I mean, I can pretty much guarantee that unless you're in like a stage performance, that it's not that often, if at all. And I actually found a really great article when I was doing a bit of research for this about language in Jane Austen's writing and how words like intercourse, well, <laughs> we all know what that means nowadays or what it can mean back then. Um, it actually meant, as the author of the article, Shannon Winslow puts it, and I'm going to look down for this because I don't want to get a quote wrong, any type of exchange between people, usually a conversation, and it can be really hard, especially for younger readers nowadays, I think, to pick up a well-respected, well-loved classic and to have a total understanding instantaneously of what's taking place. Because I know from my own readings of classics that I've had to flick back through chapters and pages before, kind of had to look up a bit that I'm really unsure about, that kind of thing. And I know I felt this way, even with the amazing GCSE teacher I had and studying Pride and Prejudice, which I think was one of my first proper, like, thick classics. And even with a teacher that great, I still really struggle to enjoy it. And for that reason, I would argue that classics aren't really as relevant and like revolutionary anymore, because if you've got no idea what anything means or you misinterpret anything, it can be really hard to get the willpower to keep going and to finish that book. Even if it's for uni, if it's for your own enjoyment, like it's really difficult to find the willpower to get through that if you don't have a clue what's going on. Um, this also applies in a, an example that I've already sort of mentioned to Virginia Woolf's tangent style, which I found really hard to get on with when I read Mrs. Dalloway over the summer. Um, I know it's meant to be like this, but when you combine it with a sort of older form of English, which I know it's not as kind of bad, but it's still a little bit difficult to wrap your head around. These classics shape up to be relics of a completely forgotten age of communication. People don't really tend to latch onto this anymore. 
And that is an example of the kind of thing I'm really staging in this debate, just saying like my against and then my for. So now we're moving on to the four point for why classics are still relevant in regards to language. Not all classics use this complex, sophisticated style. Many children's classics and even more mature like works are quite easy to wrap your head around. Um, Alice in Wonderland, Wind in the Willows, Fairy Tales, like these classic beloved works are passed down through many generations and they have a more simplistic storyline. The language is basic, mainly because it's for children or for like parents to read to their children. But it's meant that you, it's it's structured in such a way that you're meant to understand it on the first reading. It still makes them completely relevant and enjoyable in the 21st century. My personal favourite that I remember my dad reading to me a lot was The Three Little Pigs. I've still got my original edition of it back at home. Um, this was roughly written from my research in 1890 and I still loved it as a 21st century child. Um, and being able to read these books again on my children's literature module from a new kind of adult perspective, it makes all the underlying social commentary really like clear and really interesting actually. And I love being able to compare my thoughts then to what I think of it now. Like Tom's Midnight Garden, I used to hate that book. It was so boring. Like the same thing over and over again in every chapter. And now I've read it again, I really don't think it's that bad. It's not as strenuous as I remember. Um, it's actually quite revolutionary and I, I definitely see why people consider it one of the most well-loved children's works of all time. It's important to give these things another go as you get older, especially with the language. Um, and even some more mature fiction I could grasp, like one of my favourite classics that I read in summer is Little Women. I love that, not just because I share the same name as one of the sisters, Amy, but I'm 19, like about to turn 20, and it was really easy to get my head around it. Um, and I do feel that if I'd have given it a go when I was younger, like I would have gotten most, if not all of what was going on, which I can't really say the same for Jane Austen, Dickens, that sort of. Victorian style of writing. Um, so although older styles of language are often more challenging to read, it doesn't apply for every single story you're ever going to read from the like generation of classics. I think there's always going to be a classic, even if you don't think there is at the moment, that you can pick up, you can start reading it and you could think, hey, I actually understand this. And you might not particularly like it, but I think the fact that you can still interpret what's going on means that classics aren't relics, they are pretty relevant and you just, it's just a case of finding the right one for you, I think. The second idea that I'm going to be discussing in regards to this debate is the portrayal of women in classic literature, which from my studies, not just university, but A-level, even back to GCSE and beforehand, was one of the key themes that we always, always used to study. Um, and when I was doing my A-levels, I had to compare Handmaid's Tale, a 20th century modern slash postmodern dystopian text with the 19th century gothic classic Frankenstein. Um, and I love both these texts, but one of the things we looked at was comparing the ways that these two texts portrayed the female protagonists or like the female side characters in regards to Frankenstein. This point is going to be in terms of classics being a relic, so against. Um, and a comparison of these two is going to be very useful, so I'm just going to explain sort of a brain dump of what I'm thinking of. Um, in Frankenstein and gothic classics in general, women are portrayed as the weaker sex reliant on men who, in this case, you know, Victor Frankenstein fails to protect Elizabeth from his monster. Spoiler alert, she dies. Are we surprised? No. <laughs> um, we see this in Dracula too, which I read over summer. Really, really enjoyed Dracula. Quite upset I hadn't read it before. But Mina is constantly left behind. Like, she's seen as a complete burden on the party of like strong men going off to hunt vampires. And she's even put on her own in an insane asylum with a guy who's got an affiliation to Dracula. So they clearly don't have that much concern about her. They don't think she's intelligent enough to be going along with them. It was actually quite annoying reading it because I thought if they'd have included her, she would have helped them out a lot. But if we look at The Handmaid's Tale, a 20th century text and Moira's character in particular, and if you've read the book, then you may know where I'm gonna come from on this. But this is a text where, although women are essentially portrayed as breeding machines, um, they fight back, you know? Offred allies herself with the May Day organization, the rebels. Moira goes on the run as a lesbian who 
is ostracized and completely outcast. So even Serena Joy tries to work with Offred. And women are at the heart of this book in particular, um, female author, female characters. And I must have read it about four or five times, maybe even six or seven over A-levels. And now I can truly see that in this modern book, women are trying to make themselves heard in a society that is doing its best to totally and wholeheartedly oppress them. And a lot of classics really, really don't allow for that. So that makes me feel that they're quite outdated if they don't allow women's voices to be heard and they kind of push them to the side, like for the weaker sex, if they die, they die sort of thing. Um, and I think that that's a really, really outdated view, which I hope a lot of you agree with. However, on the other hand, this is why classics are still relevant, even in relation to the representation of women, because a lot of classics are written by women about strong, independent female protagonists. Um, think Jane Eyre, think Little Women, Jane Austen novels, as much as I don't like them, I can respect that she is a female author writing about strong female protagonists and how they kind of reject society's expectations of them. These ones are great, I loved Jane Eyre, I read it over summer, um, the female protagonists are empowered, they make their own decisions, like in Pride and Prejudice, Elizabeth rejects Mr. Collins, which, you know, it's a complete outcry in her family, like, you could have been secure, you could have been married, but she decides, no, I don't love him, I'm not gonna marry him. Um, Jane Eyre puts herself first, she kind of takes some time for herself, realises that, you know, she thinks Mr. Rochester's messing her around a bit. From, like, the final third of the book, she kind of takes some time, goes off on her own little adventure so to speak she, even like alice and alice in wonderland she's a young girl protagonist and she's lost in this strange world but she manages to get through it pretty much by herself because everyone that she encounters maybe excluding the cheshire cat and i guess to some extent the caterpillar she's completely on her own and they're all trying to hinder her more than help her at least that's my opinion of it. Um, Mary Lennox in The Secret Garden, she starts off as a complete spoiled brat, um, doesn't have any regard for authority, she's so selfish, but by the end of the novel, she's healthy, she's happy, and it's all thanks to like nature and the garden and just realizing that being selfish really is not the best way to go. And meeting Colin and Dickon really helps her with that. Women and girls in so many of these classic novels aren't actually oppressed and they're at the centre of the plot, they're the complete forefront of the novel, it all revolves around how they react to things, how they grow and what they do. Um, we get to see them grow into someone strong and intelligent, not every classic has this damsel in distress icon and not every female protagonist relies on someone else to empower her and this is actually what makes so many classics still relevant, the fact that the women that are oppressed in some are actually at the forefront of others so a lot of classics outdated views of women but thankfully a lot of other classics and a lot of the more popular classics do have women at the forefront of things and they're portrayed in kind of a strong manner the final point i want to make about history and society is going to be a bit more vague but i will still do my best with it so history, societal norms, etiquette. In the novels I study, children are really starting to be seen as their own kind of age group, so to speak. Um, they're children, not like a lot of other older classics, where they're just seen as like mini adults. It's when it's being recognised, especially with the introduction of the first golden age of childhood, that children are their own independent kind of beings, if you will. They're not just a small, shrunken version of adults. They shouldn't be expected to behave in the same way. They should be allowed to explore childhood and have that time of purity, innocence, and curiosity. Um, I've recently read Great Expectations and I really don't like how Pip was re actually like portrayed. Um, even at the start, before he comes into like his wealth and his monetary gain, as a mini adult, he isn't allowed to have the kind of childhood that like you or I probably would have had, like learning about things, being curious. Society's views of how we view children have really changed since the publication of novels like Great Expectations and the Victorian Age. Um, moving through now to etiquette, which kind of comes more under society. Expectations of women, again, like this sort of speak when spoken to agenda that applied to children and even women isn't really as prominent nowadays because kids are lippy like year sevens try and talk to year elevens and when i was year seven the year elevens looked like 30 year old businessmen and women so 
I don't know how they're doing that, but respect for elders was a big thing back then. Like classroom conventions, standing up when an authority figure came into the room, like classroom physical corporal punishment. It's arguably like, it's completely outdated. It doesn't happen to the same extent, if at all anymore. Um, and these classics that portray it are complete relics because it doesn't represent the society we live in today. It's such an outdated picture of where and what we do. It's not relatable fiction. We can't really relate to the protagonist going through pain and suffering because that kind of pain and suffering doesn't really happen to us anymore. Literature, there's always a potential that we won't be as invested in what happens because we just don't get why these things are even happening in the first place. Um, yeah. But on the other hand, it is quite clearly a source of history. All these classics, all these poems, all these memoirs, it's a source of history and society. You know, it shows you what it used to be like. And if any of these traditions actually still remain in our own society, history is so important in seeing like what went well back then and what actually went wrong. Um, literature, it's fictional, but it shows us these times and this world and how perhaps the average citizen like you or I would have reacted and experienced things. So classics aren't all that outdated because they just show us what once was, not what is. And an integral part of learning about humanity and progression, like things like science and technology, medicine, education, um, transport, that sort of thing. Um, in my eyes, it teaches you these things and that's such an important concept to learn. And I do think that they are still relevant in terms of being just a piece of history that you can go back through, kind of experience what these people did, but in a fictional form, if that makes sense. So I definitely think that with all three of the points I've mentioned, classics are still really, really relevant, um, as outdated as they may seem initially. And that is my little debate on classics, whether they're relevant, whether they're relics, and I would love to know what you thought. My final verdict, um, classics may not represent the present society, the truth, or even a current picture of what is happening in the world today. Um, but there's so much variety and choice within the genre of classics. I hate doing that, but it's the best way to represent it. Um, that from someone who absolutely used to despise classics, there will always be something that you can find and try out. And you just gotta keep trying until you find the one you like. So there's always a lot more to discover than initially meets the eye. So they're very much relevant in my eyes. Thank you very much for watching. Let me know if you agree. Let me know if you wholeheartedly disagree. Um, let me know too if there's any books in particular you would like me to talk about in future videos, any topics, that sort of thing. Um, this to me is a really interesting topic and I would love to talk to more people about it. So feel free to comment below, message me on Instagram, message me on book Twitter, anything is fine. I would just be really intrigued to talk to more people about this very, very interesting topic. Um, if you enjoyed the video, don't forget to give it a like and subscribe because I'm trying to reach 50 subscribers. I know it's not a lot, but it's a personal milestone. So I might as well just put that out there. And any support at all would be very much appreciated. So I will hopefully see you in the near future and happy reading. I need to do a thumbnail picture. How's this going now? Just, just pog. Pog. <laughs>